Uh, so as uh, Dr. Langer was saying, squamous cell lung cancers and Maureen uh, account for now about 25% of all non-small cell lung cancers. There's definitely been a histologic shift over the past 70 or 80 years. It's not entirely clear as to why. There's some obvious answers, decreased rates of cigarette smoking, proximal you know, lung inhalation being one issue uh, for squamous cell lung cancer, the use of filters in cigarettes, but this doesn't explain everything. So this is still a little bit of an uh, oddity. Uh, but in any event, so there are 350,000 cases of squamous cell diagnosed uh, every year worldwide, so it's still a large burden of disease. And the issue is this. The issue is that we're not very good at treating it. Uh, for chemotherapy, this is certainly available for squamous cell lung cancer patients. And, you know, the newest thing really is the Scagliati trial, cisplatin and gemcitabine in 2008, as better than cisplatin and pemetrex said. Of course, this doesn't answer any other question with regards to carbotaxel, et cetera. Avastin is FDA approved for adenocarcinoma, but not squamous cell lung cancer, not because we don't think it's effective, but because the uh, early phase study showed some toxicity with regards to hemoptysis and death, which we think is largely, I think many of us, structural and anatomic central lesions, uh, things like that. Uh, of course, the EGFR TKIs are approved uh, f technically in the second and third line setting uh, for any non small cell lung cancer patient. Uh, but I think the aggregate data suggests that if you don't have an EGFR mutation, you're not going to respond to therapy, um, which is why I left it a question mark. And for crizotinib, again, FDA approved for alkaline range non small cell lung cancer, but again, the data are suggesting that for pure adeno uh, squamous cell lung cancers, we don't really see alkaline arrangements. And I'll get into the data a little bit more. Uh, it's good as a foil for the talk to take a look quickly at lung adenocarcinoma and how it is that sort of targeted therapy has evolved for it since 1999, where we knew that KRAS mutations, and even before then, accounted for about 25% of non-small cell lung cancer cases. We couldn't do anything about that, but we knew. In 2004 is when three different groups identified uh, in sensitizing mutations in the epidermal growth factor receptor with direct sequencing of patient samples who had remarkable responses uh, on the um, uh, phase three studies, and before also uh, for uh, Tarceva which accounts now for about 15 to 20% of cases of lung adenocarcinoma. And this, of course, kick-started the revolution in targeted therapy as we began to uh, take a look at other potential oncogenes and tumor suppressors, so that between 2005 and 2013, we expanded the pie a great deal such that now we can identify an actionable target. By actionable, I mean we have either an FDP drug or a clinical trial agent, which is pretty promising. In about 60% of cases, TCGA will probably will release their analysis of lung adenocarcinoma in the next few months, I'm certain, and there are, this pie is going to get smaller based on that as well. Squamous cell lung cancer, if we take a look at the same time period, has been relatively fallow. 1999, the pie was unity in a bad way, unity in a bad way. Uh, 2004 to 2010, again, unknown in 100% of cases. And beginning in 2010, and then leading up to this point is when we began to piece in uh, parts of the pie. And as you can see, the pie is completely different, largely different from lung adenocarcinoma. So FGFR1 amplification, for those of you who answered that, the 35%, happens in about 20% of cases. There's some controversy based on definition of amplification. PI3 kinase changes are abundant in squamous cell lung cancer, much more than in lung adenocarcinoma, making this a promising sort of signaling pathway to target. And then DDR2 mutations, which uh, I'll talk about a little bit, are uncommon. They happen in about 3 to 4 percent of cases. Um, and then the 50 percent of the pie is I listed as unknown, but in fact it's not unknown. We do know what's in that 50 percent of the pie. Uh, based on sequencing data, genomic data from TCGA. It's just none of this stuff has a paired clinical trial yet, which is why I listed it as unknown. So we could sort of talk about the esoterica of TCGA, but instead of doing that, what I wanted to focus on were the specific targets and signaling pathways that had active clinical trials right now as things that are relevant that you could refer patients to. Um, based on molecular analysis. This includes FGFR1 amplification, DDR2 mutations, PI3 kinase pathway changes, and EGFR is the last topic that I want to talk about because it's still sort of relevant uh, for squamous cell lung cancer. So FGFR1 amplification we've known about for quite some time um, based on copy number analyses, array CGHs and things like that. Because of a focal peak in chromosome 8, uh, we just 
really didn't know for a while what was in chromosome 8 until 2010 when Weiss and colleagues from Martin Sauce's lab uh, published in Science Translational Medicine a series of pretty good experiments that demonstrated that, in fact, was FGFR1 uh, that was the relevant oncogene. Uh, so again, this happens between 16 to 25 percent of cases. Some series have shown case, you know, rates as low as 7 percent. Some of this variability, we don't really know why that's the case. Maybe it's just, you know, the aggregate sample sizes have not been big enough. But I think most of us think that it's falling in the 15 to 20 percent range. The correlation with protein expression is unknown, um, and I raise this just because of this issue of a predictive biomarker. So very briefly, just about this signaling pathway, I sort of skeletonized thing, things. FGFR1 is a receptor tyrosine kinase. There are a whole host of fibroblast growth factors that lead to receptor dimerization after ligand binding. And then there are three main pathways that are important, PI3 kinase signaling, uh, the MAP kinase pathway, and pro protein kinase C. And all of these things lead into growth division and angiogenesis. Um, FGFR1 is closely related to VEGF receptor, PDGFR alpha, and things like that as well in the kinome. Um, so amplification does predict sensitivity to drug in vitro and in vivo in that paper. This is cell line data in the top left corner. Basically, the ones at the very bottom are the ones that are growth inhibited, and they all, or most of them, have amplified FGFR1, which is the asterisk. The converse is how much apoptosis you're getting in response to drug. So the tall bars are the good ones on the left, and that shows that the majority of these have FGFR1 amplification as well. And then in vivo, this is a xenograph model of a cell line that has endogenously FGFR1. You can see that in escalating doses of drug, the tumor volume change uh, curve becomes better, uh, and at the highest doses, you actually get tumor reduction. It's important to note that you know, unlike what all of the, uh, most of the lung adenocarcinoma oncogenic drivers like EGFR and ALK, FGFR1 is not a mutually exclusive event. It, there's a lot of overlap, in particular with PI3 kinase pathway changes. And this data is pulled from the TCGA data, data set, which is public. And the box basically shows on the top panel, pic 3 ca changes. This is either amplification in red or mutations in green. And then right below that, FGFR1 changes. Again, red is amplification, green is mutations. And you can see there's a lot of overlap with pic 3 ca amplification, also a series of overlaps with pic 3 ca mutations. And this is an issue. It's an issue because, as I said in that skeleton diagram, PI3 kinase is, uh, is downstream of FGFR1. And so simple inhibition of FGFR1, which is the strategy we're all pursuing right now, may not work for probably about 25% at least of these patients uh, because of activation of uh, PI3 kinase signaling downstream of this. Um, the number of trials are abundant. So a lot of drug companies already had in development FGFR1 inhibitors, and they're all now in active uh, phase one trials, AstraZeneca, Novartis, GSK, Shugai, which, and then Debio purchased their drug, and then even Johnson & Johnson has an FGFR1 inhibitor as well. It's important to note that um, radiographic PRs have been reported. These are confirmed partial responses to drug, in particular the Novartis compound. Um, we don't know what the denominator is yet. We may hear about some of the data at ASCO next year, though. And again, all of these trials are ongoing at, at various sites in the United States. So DDR2 is an interesting receptor for two reasons. One is because I think it's the most promising target, though it's uncommon, and the second is because we don't really know much about it, despite that. So it's a little bit unusual because it uh, is involved in ECM signaling. So the ligand is not a mitogen, it's collagen. Um, and again, in terms of signaling, we don't know much about it. We know that SARC is probably involved. We know that JAKSTAT signaling is probably involved. And we know that it functions similarly to integrin receptors. Uh, in 2011, or early 2012, uh, Peter Hammerman up at Dana-Farber uh, published uh, the identification of these sporadic DDR2 mutations um, in a series of resected squamous cell lung cancer patients. And again, these are not hotspot mutations. They uh, cross the functional domains. Um, and they happen in about 3 to 4% of cases. Uh, it's druggable, he showed with disatinib. And interestingly, we knew disatinib was a good drug for it about four years before Peter published his data, just because people were looking to see, uh, you know, what DDR2 uh, may respond to. Um, and here is, again, the xenograph model. The left mouse was treated with vehicle, and you can see a little pimple, which is the tumor. And in the right, you don't really see any pimples. And the growth response curve, again, is shown uh, below that. So it works in mice. 
and it works in people. So there are clinical responses that have been reported to dasatinib uh, in two case reports. One was a little bit of a messier one um, that Peter reported on in a phase one study of dasatinib and Tarceva uh, in uh, sort of unselected patients um, where the patient did not have an EGFR mutation but had a partial response to therapy and they sequenced and the patient had a DDR2 mutation. The other one is this, published in Lung Cancer about a month ago, which was a 50-year-old Tyree smoker who diagnosed synchronously with CML and a right upper lobe squamous cell lung tumor when they biopsied it. The patient began to satin him for CML in preparation for curative surgical resection for the patient's disease and the 10-week PET scan was done for restaging before surgery and it showed this which was a near complete response to dasatinib. Uh, they went ahead and they sequenced the patient's tumor um, and they found a DDR2-S768 I mutation, which is the same one that Peter had found in his patient as well. So again, two case reports, which you know, pretty compelling uh, clinical data that this is gonna pan out to be um, an actionable target. And there's a single trial of dasatinib in patients with DDR2 mutant lung squamous cell cancer that's open at some institutions also that BMS um, has launched. So the PI3 kinase pathway uh, is the penultimate pathway. So um, this is pulled from the TCGA paper. It's a little busy, but focusing just on the left really gives you a sense of how frequent these alterations are. If you take a look at P10, which is the tumor suppressor for PIK3CA, 15% um, uh, in terms of mutations and copy number loss. Um, PIK3CA mutations, 16%, uh, again, a whole host of amplified cases. And even downstream AKT mutations, uh, mutations in TSC1 and TSC2, alterations in uh, uh, TORC1 and TORC2 as complexes also. And these are all downstream of relevant uh, tyrosine kinases for squamous cell lung cancer also, including the FGFRs again. So separate from uh, KRAS uh, signaling and MAP kinase signaling. Uh, again, these pathway changes are common. Between 30 to 50% of cases are gonna have one of these alterations, and PIK3C amplification occurs in conjunction with these, uh, probably in another 20 to 30%. So a very common target, much more common, again, than lung adenocarcinoma, arguing that there is uh, potentially uh, some uh, important uh, biologic role uh, to this. Um, the clinical trials, unfortunately, for PI3 kinase signaling uh, aberrations still are not very common uh, because most companies are focusing their PI3 kinase inhibitor strategies on um, sort of things like breast cancer, where the data are uh, much more mature. Nevertheless, Novartis does have a compound BKM120, uh, which is um, available uh, for patients with uh, PI3 kinase pathway changes, which is currently on hold pending an interim analysis to see whether or not it'll go forward for uh, efficacy. Again, overlap with other signaling pathways will complicate this, so it's gonna be messier than what we've seen with lung adenocarcinoma, um, and I think this is something we just need to be prepared to do and prepared just to tease apart. So EGFR is the last thing I wanted to talk about um, for a number of different reasons, some of which Maureen had uh, alluded to. Uh, I think we have enough data to show uh, that canonical exon 19 deletions and L858R point mutations do not happen in pure squamous cell lung cancers. Uh, this was shown by the TCGA data set with you know, good, resected, high-quality tumor specimens. It's something that we showed as well. A uh, colleague of mine, Natasha Reckman, along with Maureen and, and everyone else, uh, in a series of 90 resected squamous cell lung cancers also. The exception that we found that has made it into the NCCN guidelines, and so which uh, is important, is that there are cases of underdiagnosed adenosquamous cell lung cancer. So there are cases in the literature where a squamous cell lung cancer patient will have an EGFR mutation. Um, and we think, at least based on our own retrospective series, where we, we were able to identify stage four squamous cell lung cancer patients diagnosed on the small biopsy, where another biopsy showed a glandular component either at a metastasis or within the same primary, that again, these are underdiagnosed adenosquamous because the biopsy missed the glandular component, or a solid adenocarcinoma, which looked you know, morphologically like a squamous cell lung cancer. So the NCCN does recommend uh, EGFR mutation testing in a select subgroup, never smokers diagnosed with squamous cell lung cancer from small biopsy specimens, just because there is at least some chance that these will be adenosquamous lung cancers. Uh, each of our amplification occurs in 7 to 10 percent of cases. Some rare ones have been found in TCGA as well. Um, and then each of our expression, which is the last thing I'm going to focus on, uh, is common in squamous cell lung cancer and more common than in adenocarcinomas. And I wrote this role of H-score awaits prospective validation because um, 
so the flex because of the flex trial basics. So the flex trial was uh, a trial randomizing non-small cell lung cancer patients with stage four disease to chemotherapy with or without uh, cetuximab. It was technically a positive trial in terms of survival benefit, and there's some interesting subgroup analyses. This is just based on uh, the initial data set for um, clinical characteristics is that, uh, you know, squamous cell lung cancer, it appeared uh, as if, uh, in terms of the forest plot, there may be a stronger signal than in adenocarcinoma tumors. In the retrospective analysis for FLEX, so this is where they took a look at EGFR expression and the tumors that had, um, in cases where there was enough tumor, uh, and scored intensity and multiplied it by the percentage of cells that had intensity, that intensity for a score between zero to 300, where 300 is maximal staining. They stratified by a 200 as a cutoff for high expressors and low expressors. And in the subgroup analysis, the relevant thing for this discussion is that in the high expressors, one of the things that fell out as significantly different was squamous cell lung cancer, which appeared to have um, an improved um, uh, survival based on, uh, again, this retrospective analysis. Um, this is going to be prospectively validated. It is being prospectively validated in a SWOG trial. But the other thing is that um, there is a completed um, phase three study of a fully humanized version of cetuximab called nesetumumab that Lily uh, reported on uh, in August, the top sheet results. It was cisgem with or without nesetumumab that it was a positive trial, basically, that the overall survival endpoint was met, that in terms of the trial protocol, it had to have been at least a, an improvement in median survival from 11 to 13.75 months. Um, and so again, the first positive trial for a kind of biomarker-ish um, study in squamous cell lung cancer that we have really uh, ever seen. Um, I'm sure the data are gonna be reported at ASCO in more detail, so we'll end up seeing how H-score may play into this, but you know, it is a little bit compelling because it's a histologically uh, selected subgroup that had at least some additional signal on retro retrospective analysis in the FLEX study. So in conclusion, uh, this really is the oncogen landscape in lung cancer, which I'm sure all of you have seen already, which is, uh, you know, it's a series of pies. It's the lung adenocarcinoma pie, it's now the squamous cell lung cancer pie, um, and there's a small cell lung cancer pie also that's not been filled in as much, um, but that's also pretty promising. Um, and increasingly, I think now, you know, we talk about the importance of enrolling patients onto clinical trials, and it's been a little bit mundane, granted, for squamous cell lung cancer for a long time, but things are much more exciting and promising now, where I do believe that, you know, we do need to refocus on sending patients to local testing centers, um, academic centers where either molecular testing is ongoing for these things and that have these paired trials, or you know, considering other options like foundation medicine, so for-profit companies that will do these comprehensive uh, genotype screens in order to try to preemptively think about pairing your patient in the you know, third-line setting or whatnot uh, to a, a um, clinical trial that, that may make some sense and yield some benefit. Uh, that is it.